Welcome back. We're now going to move into our first plenary conversation of the day. Um, this is crucial to all of us who are trying to make choices about how to cover suicide. It's a, uh, a panel discussion on suicide research myths and trends. We who cover these issues wrestle with all three of these questions. What does the research show? What do we believe that may or may not be true and often isn't? What does the public believe that isn't true? And what really are the trends? Um, crucial issues. We've got four very important speakers. I'm going to introduce all of them. They will all speak. They will each speak, and then we'll have a conversation and take questions. So as folks are talking, just make notes to yourself of the questions you want to ask. We just kind of want to keep things going. Again, uh, there, there's uh, hashtag DartConf. I'm pleased to see that there's a pretty lively Twitter conversation lighting up on this one already, and that's good. Um, so our four speakers here. Um, first of all, we'll start with Dr. Paula Clayton who's the medical director of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, she joined in 2006. She graduated from the University of Michigan in 1956 and from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis in 1960. So she's been in the business for quite a while. Um, she was professor, became professor and head of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota School of Medicine in 1980. She's been a professor as well at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. Um, she has more connections and uh, honors and leadership in the profession than I have time to acknowledge here. You've got to separate out suicide from suicide attempts. Another risk factor is what symptoms a person has during an episode of depression. And these are all studies that have seen patients and then followed them prospectively so that they can track um, uh, suicide in the 10 years after. And so this, psych this psychic pain or desperation is a very important symptom when someone is depressed, alcohol abuse, loss of interest, poor sleep. I won't go through with them, but the psych psychosis is another subtle symptom uh, that doctors sometimes miss, even when they've seen the patient in the week before, because they don't ask about it in a good way. Anyway, these are all symptoms that I, as a psychiatrist, would worry about if I had a patient that I thought was potentially suicidal. Suicide runs in families. There are genetic studies, both twin and adoption studies, that show that suicide and suicide attempts run in families. And there are studies of brains of people who died by suicide that show there are biologic, biologic changes in them compared to deaths from other causes. So there is a biologic and genetic underpinning to some of this. And that should all be part of your thinking in reporting. These are socioeconomic risk factors. I won't go through them, being male, white, over 60, over 45, uh, being isolated, living alone. That's the explanation of why suicide is much higher in the western states than it is in our states in the east uh, because they, they have high, they're isolated and they're, they don't have access to care. Um, I put in current and, and veteran military service and periods of unemployment and, and actually uh, economic downturns are associated with outcomes of suicide. There are no or there are minimal data on a relationship between ha being GLBT and dying by suicide. That's not true of attempts, but it's true of death. Uh, and then the other factors that Maddie talked about that are very important for us to be able to change, and that's access to lethal means and local, local clusters of suicide. Those are things that we are really working on to try to decrease suicide rates. There are lots of things that are immediate, in intimate partner problems, trouble with the law, bullying, job losses, 
uh, that might be in the immediate but not necessarily the, the underlying cause of the illness. The greater the number of risk factors, the more likely there is to, for dying. Uh, I was asked to make one slide about prevention, and so certainly in our uh, understanding, awareness, this heightened education to the general public and specific groups like teachers, college personnel, clergymen, the DOD, uh, health care providers, anybody to teach them about these, the, the fact that mental disorders are associated with an outcome of suicide and they need to recognize that and refer for treatment. And then there are studies that really show that early detection and treatment uh, can lead to decrease in suicide. Uh, means restriction is another way to intervene. And fi finally, this is one uh, relating to you, responsible and informative reporting about suicide, its causes and its warning signs, while avoiding graphic, sensational media reporting, which can lead to contagion and copycat. These are the resources that, I, that are in the last page. That's places for you to go to find uh, more information. As, and, and as Dr. As Bob has told you, uh, Bob Gebbia, we have general information experts and survivors. So if you need to talk to uh, any of those, you should reach out to us. And these are the other things. Thank you very much. Center and the, the funders for putting this together. I'm really excited to be here. And in the brief time that I have, would like to say a little bit about the classification, the rates, and the prediction of suicidal behaviors because this is what Kate Black told me to talk about. And I will, and so I notice that some of what I'm going to say overlaps a little bit with Dr. Clayton, so I'm going to speed through that as not to be redundant. Why are we focusing on suicide? Dr. Clayton covered this really nicely. Uh, from a public health perspective, lots of people die by suicide, unfortunately, each year, about a million each year around the world. There are more than twice as many suicides as HIV AIDS related deaths, more than homicide. This last fact, uh, adding to what Dr. Clayton said, is true around the world. So each year around the world, more people die by suicide than all wars, all genocide, all interpersonal violence combined, which if you think about it means we're each more likely to die by our own hand than we are by someone else's, which I think is a really staggering statistic. And as is, I think the theme of the day, something we don't hear that much about. Uh, these other figures have been covered. So I want to say a little bit about classification. In, as in any area of, of research or in reporting, it's important to have clear, specific definitions for the constructs of interest. Unfortunately, the study of suicide and clinical work on suicide has been historically marred by, I think, the use of vague and inconsistent terminology. It's not uncommon, let's say if you have a, a, a person who cuts themselves, how do we describe that? It's not uncommon to hear people talk about cutting or thoughts about suicide as suicidality or deliberate self-harm or parasuicide. And the problem that some of us have with these terms is they're somewhat vague and, and they don't really tell us exactly what's going on. So researchers and clinicians and hopefully you are using more uh, specific terms for the constructs of interest here. And here they are outlined, the, the primary ones. And the big distinctions that I think a lot of us draw are between suicidal, if you can see that dot, suicidal self-injury and non-suicidal self-injury with their former referring to thoughts or behaviors in which there's some intention of dying, and the latter referring to direct, deliberate destruction of body tissue in the absence of any intent to die, you, often taking the form of cutting, burning, and the like. And, and we think of these as related but distinct behaviors. Important to note that uh, those who engage in non-suicidal self-injury, many of them will go on to make suicide attempts. And we're, we're seeing in some recent clinical trials, engaging in non-suicidal self-injury is a really strong predictor of making a suicide attempt, but they're pretty distinct. We also look at not only suicide death, but non-lethal suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And the primary outcomes that people look at are suicide ideation or suicidal thoughts, going on to make a suicide plan, and making a non-lethal suicide attempt. Again, although these are related, they're distinct. They have different base rates, different correlates, different courses, different responsiveness to treatment. And they, picking up on correlates, they relate differently to different kinds of, of uh, risk factors. For instance, if you're a woman having young kids in the home, decreases your likelihood of dying by suicide and making suicide attempts. It increases your likelihood of thinking about suicide. It's true. Uh, so some risk factors relate differently to these different types of behaviors. And something to note when you're reporting on these, if something correlated with one form of self-injury or suicide, it doesn't mean it spreads that way more broadly. Some of the best treatments we have for suicide attempts decrease likelihood of suicide attempt, but not so much suicide ideation. So again, it's important to take careful note of that. 
um, when describing findings or reporting on them. Dr. Clayton also talked about suicide rates, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, this is what suicide rates look like around the world, with red indicating high rates, yellow, moderate rates, blue, low rates, white meaning we have no data. You can see the U.S. is about the middle of, middle of the pack in terms of suicide rate. Uh, Dr. Gould mentioned this earlier, and as did Dr. Clayton, uh, men are much more likely to die by suicide than are women. This is especially true as we uh, look across the lifespan. And this is true around the globe, save a few examples like China, by a ratio of about four or five to one. Men die more than women by suicide. Women make more suicide attempts and have more thoughts of suicide. Uh, this slide is a little bit dated, but the, this is a consistent picture of what suicide looks like in the U.S. If we look at uh, the split between men, which are the two solid lines on top, women, the, the, the two lines on below, uh, and we see differences here as outlined by the CDC for white and black individuals in the United States. Overall, about 90% of suicides in the U.S. are among what the CDC calls white people, 80% are among men, and about 70% are among white men. As with many uh, statistics about suicide, we don't know why. So we have these, these glaring statistics that we cannot completely explain. Uh, Dr. Clayton showed a, a version of this slide earlier. You see the, uh, the solid line here is the overall rate of suicide in the U.S. over about a 15-year period. When you break this down in different age and gender groups, you see the rates bounce around a little bit more. One thing that I would note is when you break these groups up into smaller groups, you're going to see rates bounce around because they're smaller groups. And often you'll see, I'll see reports saying, uh, for, instance, for instance, the rate of suicide for this group has increased 10% over the past year. But if you look in context, it was flat before and is going down slightly afterwards. So if you're seeing figures like this, my suggestion would be pull the lens back a little bit and look around and see what does the, the, the pattern look like just before. An example of this, this is a study funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention led by Peter Marzik a few years back on police suicide in the New York City Police Department. And in the early 90s, you see that blue line represents the rate of suicide death for police officers, the yellow line for uh, residents in New York City, the red line for residents in New York City matched the police officers on age, sex, ethnicity. I already showed white men have high suicide rates. The New York City Police Department is made up largely of white men, so we've got to adjust for that. Still, during this period, we see a skyrocketing in the rate of suicide among police officers. There are lots of reports saying this is an epidemic, we need to do something about it. Certainly it's important, but what does it look like in context? We did a study looking at this, and we see the suicide rate dropped immediately after. And we look back over a period of years, we see the rate for, for police officers bounces around a lot. This is a smaller group than the population. And if you look, you see the blue line for police officers is only in a few instances above that uh, of the red line, which is age, sex, ethnicity, match, population. Statistically, there's no higher rate among police officers. This was just a bounce in the rate. It came right back down. As Bob Abelson says about statistics, chance is lumpy. If you've got small groups, you'll see these bounces up and down, no different than chance. I, and so in the study, suicide was not higher among police officers, although there was a trend for higher rates among female police officers. Important to think about in thinking about suicide among the U.S. Army, which people suggest has been increasing in recent years, is it just a blip or is it a, a true increase? If you look at data here, this blue line is the suicide rate for active Army soldiers, the red line, the adjusted rate for the population. The rate for Army soldiers has always been below that in population. They're a selected group, they're a supported group, they're a well-resourced group. In the past years, we've seen this rate creep up pretty consistently. And if, if you look back over time, the rate is always below the population. This does seem to be a true increase, not just a blip. So again, important to think about if you're looking at rates, thinking about rates, pull the lens back a little bit and see, is it just a blip on the radar? If it is a blip, I would, who am I? I'd still say report on it. It's still an important issue. If police officers are dying at a higher rate, we should report on it, we should know about it but I'd limit the inferences you make about this being a global epidemic and this being a long, long-standing uh, problem. Kate also asked me to say a little bit about prediction. Uh, although we've, we've learned a lot about suicide and about suicidal behaviors, it remains a really difficult problem to predict. It's one of my favorite slides. For those who can't read it, this guy says, we can thank Hippocrates for changing healing from an occult art to a science. And this guy says, but look at all we have to learn. And he says, yeah, let's change it back to an occult art. The idea being, this is a difficult problem to, to understand and to study and to predict. Many say, well, it's impossible, and let's just use you know, the art of prediction, or we'll use our gut or our clinical intuition. Uh, and I would argue, many would argue, that's, that's not the way to go. There are things we can do to try and improve prediction. It's difficult. Uh, taking what we've learned, white men are at high risk, army soldiers are at high risk, this doesn't really tell us in any individual case who's going to, to uh, 
uh, make a suicide attempt or die by suicide. And as many of you have experienced and know, uh, this is a really difficult act to, to understand and to predict precisely when it's going to occur. There's a big push in the field in terms of research trends to identify objective markers of risk. People are doing this in, in the form of biological markers, looking for genetic factors, brain-based factors that can help us identify who's at risk. Others are looking at behavioral markers for suicide risk. And I want to talk about some work that, that our, our group and other groups are doing in this area. One of the challenges is trying to address is that current methods of assessing risk of suicide rely almost ex exclusively on explicit self-report. If we want to know if someone wants to hurt themselves or kill themselves, we ask them, are you going to hurt yourself or kill yourself? This is a terrible way to assess risk because, as we know, people are motivated to deny or conceal thoughts about self-injury or suicide for fear of being intervened upon or being hospitalized. Because often if someone tells us they're going to hurt themselves or kill themselves, we'll lock them in a hospital until they convince us they're not going to hurt or kill themselves, and then we release them. We know that this is a problem. Uh, data suggests that one of the highest risk times of suicide death is immediately after people leave the hospital, in the week or two after they leave. Uh, other studies have shown that nearly 80% of people who die by suicide in the hospital explicitly deny suicidal thoughts and intentions in their last communication before dying, suggesting we can't just rely on what people are telling us. We need methods of assessing the risk for self-injurious thoughts and behaviors that don't rely simply on explicit self-report. In other words, we have someone in front of us. We want to know what they're thinking, what their risk is. We can ask them, and this gentleman says, I don't want to hurt myself. What we really want to know is, how is he thinking about su suicide or self-injury? What are his unspoken thoughts or his, what we would call, implicit cognitions? Implicit cognitions is a whole area of psychological research going in this area, trying to uh, assess implicit cognitions or those that are not reliant on conscious introspection or explicit self-reporting. We want to know what's in a person's mind. We can ask them, but psychologists are developing new ways of measuring people's thoughts and how they think about things using their behavior. Uh, looking at what kind of things they remember or how they respond to stimuli that are presented to them in a computer screen. And using these methods, these behavioral methods, we can start to understand what people are thinking without asking them. One such method you might have heard of is the Implicit Association Test, or IAT, uh, developed by Tony Greenwald and colleagues uh, about a decade or so ago. It's been, you, you, any, by show of hands, who's heard of this test? Okay, a few people. It, when it came out, and since then it's been on 60 Minutes in 2020, so it has gotten some press. Uh, it's essentially a brief, often computer-based reaction time test that uses the speed of your response to different stimuli to measure how you think about different things. It's created by social psychologists who are very interested in things like racial bias, bias against elderly, political beliefs, and so on. And I'll give you a, my quick poor man's demonstration of it. You're seated at a computer screen. We'll do a political IAT. I'm going to show you images of either Bill Clinton or George Bush. You'll also see images of good words, strong, smart, leader, or bad words, stupid, weak, incompetent. I want you to put two fingers on your keyboard. When you see an image of Bill Clinton or a good word, hit the left key. When you see George Bush or a bad word, hit the right key. Do that as fast as you can without making mistakes, and you do that for 40 trials. We measure your response time in milliseconds. Then we flip it and say, now hit the left key for George Bush and a good word, the right key for Bill Clinton or a bad word. And you do that as fast as you can without making mistakes. We re record your response time in milliseconds and compare them. Simple task. Interestingly, if you're a Democrat, you respond significantly faster when you're pairing Bill Clinton and good on the same key. If you have to pair George Bush and good on the same key, it takes a little bit longer to push the button. And the opposite is true as well. If, you've got a, if you're a Republican, it takes a little bit longer to hit the same key for Bill Clinton and good. And this test, some nice things about this test are, it's been shown to be reliable. It's pretty hard to fake good, so to speak. So if you're a Democrat, it's hard to act like a Republican and, and modify your, your speed. Uh, probably in more ways than one. If uh, the test is sensitive to change over the course of treatment, people who get treatment for anxiety disorders, their implicit associations about anxiety-related stimuli change, and it's been shown to predict future behavior like voting. So what we wondered is, can we create an implicit association test that measures how people think about self-injury and suicide, and will it predict their future behavior better than, say, self-report? So a version of this test replaced Bill Clinton and George Bush with, in this case, cutting and no cutting, replace good and bad with me and not me. This is what the task looks like on a computer screen. We'll show images appear, images like cut skin. So you'll, you'll hit the left key for this because it goes with cutting. Me-related words like me, mine, I, hit the left key. Non-cut skin, right key, right key. We record your response times. Now we switch. Now cutting goes with not me, and you do the same task 40 times each. What we would expect is if you're somebody who wants to hurt yourself, you'll be faster responding to these stimuli when cutting and me are paired, because you think of cutting as like me. 
If you're someone who does not want to hurt themselves, you'll be faster when cutting and not near paired on the same key. What we do is, again, for those who are interested, take your response times for one block, subtract it from the other, divide by the standard deviation of your response latencies so we get a standard score for each person. So if you're just a slow responder or a fast responder, that's taken into account. And so what we do then is calculate one score for you called a D score, which is positive if you're faster responding when cutting and, and me are paired. Negative if you're faster responding when cutting or not me are paired. So if you're somebody who wants to hurt yourself, we would expect you to show on this objective test a positive D score. And so to test this out, I alluded earlier to lab-based studies. This is one of these studies we're doing now to try and improve our ability to understand and predict in this area. We bring an initial study adolescents into, the, into our laboratory, some of whom engage in non-suicidal self-injury, some of whom are matched on age, sex, ethnicity, intelligence, who don't. We give them this task and see if they differ. And what we see is the self-injurers uh, have a much stronger D-score. They're much faster responding when cutting and me are paired on the same key, and the opposite is true for non-injurers. On one hand, you say, big deal. We know these groups differ because they told us that. On the other hand, we think it is kind of a big deal in that this is what we're trying to do now is identify behavioral markers or biological markers that can tell us about group differences. We then want to see if this test can differentiate between suicide-related groups because that's really what we're ultimately interested in. Same test, and what we see is it, differences, it, it differs pretty strongly between non-suicidal adolescents, those who are currently thinking about suicide, and those who have recently made a suicide attempt. So we see these pretty big group differences. This is differences at one point in time. What we really want to do is predict suicidal behavior in the future. So we developed a suicide version of this test. Instead of cutting and not cutting, we have words related to life and death. And we brought this to the emergency department at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And as people are coming into the emergency department, some having just made a suicide attempt, some coming in for other psychiatric emergencies, uh, they're severely depressed, severely anxious, they're having panic attacks, they're violent, whatever it is. We gave them all the implicit association test to see, do people who have just made an attempt have stronger identifications with death? And can we identify it with this test? We see they do. They have much stronger identification with, uh, with death. The big test is, can we predict into the future who's going to make a suicide attempt? So of the suicide attempters, we follow them over time. We call them. We look at the hospital to see who was readmitted for a suicide attempt. And what we see is, for those who had a positive D score, 22% made a suicide, another attempt in the next six months. For those who had a negative D score, they had an identification with life, only 7% made a suicide attempt in the next six months. So the test significantly distinguishes between these groups. Our final question is, can we improve the prediction of who's going to make an attempt? Currently, we use chart diagnosis. If people are depressed, they're more likely to make an attempt. We ask people, uh, we ask clinicians, and we did all those things and tried to predict. And then we said, does this test add anything? And it does. It significantly improves our prediction above and beyond all of those things. And I should note, clinicians are no better than chance at predicting suicide attempts or suicide death. Um, patients are better, are better than chance, uh, but still leave I think, a long way to go in terms of accurate prediction. So an example of the kind of tests that we're trying to develop to improve prediction. One other test we're working on um, hypothesizes here that if, if someone's thinking about suicide, again, the question is how do you get at suicidal thoughts without asking, if someone's thinking about suicide, if we show them words and ask them to name the color of words, so we're going to show words, if they're red, hit a red button, if they're blue, hit a blue button. If they're thinking about suicide, they should be slower responding to suicide-related words. They see the word, it captures their attention, interferes with their ability to respond. So we have people sit down at a computer screen with a red key and a blue key, and we say there's going to be neutral words, suicide-related words, negative words, Name the color. So they see a neutral word paper, red, blue, these are neutral words, suicide. We think they'll be slower here. Red, negative words, make sure it's not a negativity effect, but it's suicide specific. Same design, we give this test to people coming through the emergency department, and we want to see, do those who made a suicide attempt right upon admission, right before admission, differ from those who did not? We subtract how long it took you to respond to the suicide word from the neutral word, or subtract neutral from the suicide-related word to see how much interference is there, how much slower are you with the suicide words. The black bar are suicide attempters, the white bar non-attempters. We see no effect for the negative words, huge effect for the suicide-related words. So people who are just made an attempt, it takes them so much longer to respond if it's a suicide-related word than if it's not compared to um, non-suicidal controls. And this test, too, improves our ability to predict these, these behaviors, this behavior, 
uh, prospectively. In terms of future directions in this area, we're in the process of trying to replicate these findings with the hope that a uh, few years down the road we'll be able to have a battery of tests that can better inform us about people's risk for suicide attempts. We have a new website that we've launched where people can take these tests freely if you're interested. Uh, there's a project implicit website that has all of the race and age and gender bias IITs on it. We have a project implicit mental health website that you can go and, and take IITs related to depression, anxiety, drinking, eating disorders, uh, stigma about mental illness and treatment in general trying to collect more data and to better understand and, and help increase awareness in people's understanding about these problems. We're also going to examine the usefulness in terms of decision making and prediction, uh, develop other tests that can do this, and ultimately what we want to do, as, as a lot of us do, is use these tests as a way to test and inform treatment so we can really try and uh, increase our ability to prevent these problems in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, that was way cool. And I, I think one of the exciting and inspiring and uplifting parts of what can be a very challenging discussion is in fact the the imagination and dedication of the researchers in this field that's really interesting and I'm sure people have lots of questions uh, professor Joyner you're up good morning everyone pleasure to be here uh, I'm gonna focus on um, a few myths about suicide that I think are interesting. A couple of preliminary remarks though, there, there are at least 30 very clear and distinct myths that I could touch on. There's no time for that. So I've been real selective and just chosen a couple or three that I think are, are uh, of general interest. Idea here of course is that if we decrease ignorance and misunderstanding about suicidal behavior, then we'll be better positioned to be compassionate sympathetic and, and helpful to people who really are, when you think of it, are in agony and who deserve our compassion and respect and sympathy. Uh, contact information is here on this slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about uh, my role as the director of the Military uh, Suicide Research Consortium, but I did want to at least mention that I am the director of the Military <laughs> Suicide Research Consortium. Uh, and if you're curious about that angle, it's certainly a daily uh, preoccupation of mine and our team. Our website is at MSRC, it stands for Military Suicide Research Consortium, msrc.fsu.edu. Or you can email, email me about it if you're, if you're curious. But I'm going to focus mostly on some myths about suicide. I'm going to start with an intriguing one, at least to me, and it has to do with a topic that's already been touched on this morning, the relationship of alcohol to death by suicide. Now, Dr. Clayton and, and some others too, perhaps, maybe Dr. Gould, Dr. Nock, I can't recall, have accurately pointed out that alcohol use disorders represent a risk factor for later suicidal behavior, for death by suicide. That's true, that's, that's quite so. But I believe that that truth has led some people to imagine that most people are drunk when they die by suicide. A typical narrative that you hear in the public mind is, he got real drunk and then impulsively decided to kill himself. That's a common narrative. And a lot of the work I've been doing for the last few years is to try to say that's not accurate. First of all, it's not real accurate that people merely all of a sudden come up with a whimsical idea about something as fearsome and daunting as killing yourself. That's not something that you're whimsical about or do on the spur of the moment. There's a process in play there. Similarly, it's just simply not so that most people are drunk at the time of death. How do I know that? Well, these, uh, but before I get into that, th this is the book on which a lot of this is um, based. You know, if you want to get into the other 30 or so myths, uh, this book is one resource to do that. It, in turn, was based on this previous book, putting forth one theoretical account of why people die by suicide. But I was talking about the alcohol angle, and I just want to ponder this particular piece of data. Let me set it up for a, for a second here. On the up and down axis, you got the, well, this is probably not going to show up. On the up and down axis, you got the number of people 
who have died by suicide in this particular sample. And we got a comparison of people who have been homicide victims. Suicide decedents, represented by the black bar, black bars rather, and the homicide victims by the white bars. And then across the bottom, you got their blood alcohol content upon autopsy. Now, one trouble here is that this is a weird metric. It's not, see at the bottom, it's, it's the, a weird metric that most of us are not used to. But just to kind of translate it for you, that first bar, it reads 0 to 30 there. That would correspond to 0.00% blood alcohol content up to 0.03%. So our usual metric is 0.08% illegal cutoff. That would be in that third category over there, just to kind of orient you a little bit. And one thing I hope jumps out at you is that left big black bar in the category where either they're not drinking at all or they've had one drink or so. The vast majority of suicide decedents are in that category. Now there's a few in the more intoxicated categories, but it's, it's really, there's really not very many at all. And if you wanted to make the case that one of these forms of death was more associated with acute alcohol intoxication, you, you wouldn't jump to suicide there, you, you jump to being a victim of homicide. They're the ones in the white bar who have some pretty high levels of alcohol into intoxication at the time of death. Let me reiterate, this does not mean that alcohol use disorders are irrelevant to suicide risk. It means that in the moment, at the time of death, the modal typical blood alcohol content profile of suicide decedents is to have a 0.00% blood alcohol content. That's an interesting fact that I think too few people appreciate. Now this is just one study, of course. You can see there at the top, it's from Stockholm and it's from 83 to 92. It happens to be from people who have died from, mostly from self-inflicted uh, knife wounds. So you might question, well, is this specific to this, just this one study? My colleagues and I have now amassed a database of suicide decedents that contains now over 100,000 people, all who've died by suicide, all who've had blood alcohol content assessed at death on autopsy, and this is quite representative of those 100,000 people. 76% of those 100,000 people's blood alcohol content at their death by suicide was 0.00%. So it's a myth that people are real intoxicated at the time of death. The role of alcohol is otherwise. It's not at the moment, it's not courage in a bottle, letting somebody you know, work up the courage for death by suicide. That kind of feels right, seems intuitive, but it doesn't match the actual data. Let's talk about suicide notes for a second, shifting gears. A lot of mythology, I think, has cropped up around suicide notes, and the myth is that those who die by suicide usually leave a note. That's the myth. In fact, I just a couple months ago plucked out a headline that read, death probably an accident because no suicide note found. That was the headline. Uh, it wasn't embedded in the article. That was the headline of the article. That's not so. That, that's just not true, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Note leaving, it's kind of rare, actually. Some notes are left, certainly, but the majority of people who die by suicide don't leave a note. Depends on the study, but my take on this literature is that if you average across studies, you get a rate probably around 20, maybe to 30 percent of people who die by suicide who leave a note. So that's just interesting, to me at least, on its face. But let's drill down a little bit into this and, and try to understand why it plays out like this. Why is note leaving among suicide decedents relatively rare? I've got some speculations about that. Don't treat these as hard and fast facts, but these are my conjectures. One is that the state of mind of the person about to die by suicide is pretty socially alienated. There's isolation, as, as others have pointed out before me, social isolation is a clear risk factor for death by suicide. 
If you're in an alienated and isolated state of mind, you're not very inclined to communicate with others. And after all, a suicide note is a communication. You're just disinclined to communicate. You're too alienated to do so. It's my conjecture about one reason that the fact pattern falls out like it does. A second speculation. You know, imagine just right now, all of us sitting around in the room, I assigned you the task of writing a half page summary of your beliefs about life and death and your family and loved ones. That puts a considerable cognitive load on anybody, us in this room. We'd have trouble doing it. It would feel hard. It'd feel like a lot of work. We might not want to do that. Well, add into it the miserable crisis state of mind that suicide decedents are in. They're particularly unable to produce that kind of note. Misery makes it hard to think straight and thus hard to write anything, especially something that's as momentous as a final goodbye. As a matter of fact, the notes that do get left are often extremely concrete, down-to-earth notes about things like insurance policies, where the keys are, please call the police, bank accounts, and, and the like. They tend not to be about the nature of life and death and philosoph philosophical views on, on those things. Lastly, I don't believe it's impulsivity. I mean, you could imagine a, an idea along the lines of if people are impulsively killing themselves, they don't have time to leave a note. There's some plausibility to that idea, but I don't find it to be very persuasive because as I've already mentioned, I just doubt the notion that someone can do something as scary as this and fearsome as this, just all of a sudden, on a whim, on the spur of the moment, impulsively, I just don't buy it. And so I don't believe that that's the reason that suicide notes are rare, although I accept that it's a rival conjecture, and I'd be interested in empirical tests of these rival speculations. All right, so we've covered a couple myths. One has to do with the public understanding of impulsive, alcoholic suicide. I don't think it works that way. Another has to do with the idea, you know, if there's not a suicide note, then it wasn't a suicide there. That's not so. It's usually the other way around. And then this one, actually, Dr. Clayton touched on it nicely, and I'm going to reiterate it because I think it's important. And I've called it the, the cry for help myth. And the myth is that if you're talking about killing yourself, mainly you're motivated to cry out for help. That's what you're doing. You're not really going to kill yourself. You're really just trying to cry out for help. That's the myth. If that were so, I mean, actually, let me back up for that. It's a strange thing to think that about human discourse. For instance, I told my family and friends that I'm coming here to Philadelphia. That's what I said I would do, and then I did it. And it would be peculiar if my friends and family said, oh, you're, you're just talking. You're not really going to go to Philadelphia. You're just talking. If, if, you, if you were going to go, you'd just go, and you wouldn't say anything about it. It's peculiar to think that way. And why is, it, why is suicide an exception? I, I don't think it should be. The fact is that a lot of people who die by suicide, not all, but a lot, tell people exactly what they intend to do in the days uh, before their death. I, I'm very influenced by this study that's uh, depicted on the screen here. It's from a, a giant of 20th century mental health scholarship, Eli Robbins. And in this study, Dr. Robbins and colleagues studied 134 people who had died by suicide in the St. Louis area. In this book, it's called The Final Months. I heartily recommend it. It's wonderful. There's tons of information about these decedents. So I just picked out one piece here, and it's that of the 134, 7 out of 10 told people in the days before their death that they were going to die by suicide. And often, by the way, these allusions to suicide were not vague. They were not things like, I'm thinking of death. I'd be better off gone. Although people do say stuff like that, too. These communications are more likely to be along the lines of, 
I intend to go to this place, to that place, and to do this thing. Pretty specific. Seven out of ten commuted their time. Among those seven out of ten, these researchers looked at how many times the eventual decedent had said something along the lines of, I intend my death, and the mean number of suicidal communications of intent was greater than three. So it wasn't just that they said it once usually, it was multiple times. Let me acknowledge, however, that that's only 70%. That means 30% don't communicate anything. Three out of 10 of these deaths did come completely out of the blue and shocked everybody. So that does happen, it's important to acknowledge. But most of the time, there's seven out of 10, this, this stat I think is on the high end of such estimates, but it's in the ballpark. Most people communicate some intent, it's important to know. It's also important to acknowledge that people talk about their deaths for a while, long while sometimes, and don't die. That happens too. But there's another example that I wanted to point out. I'm gonna close with this, I believe, yeah. And it's uh, from the documentary, The Bridge. Many of you have probably seen that. It's at the Golden Gate Bridge. The filmmakers train their cameras on the bridge for a year every day, and in so doing, captured many deaths by uh, suicide from the bridge. If you've seen the film, you'll remember this character, Gene, this fellow Gene, who had long black hair, dressed in black. His death was one of the ones captured on the film from the bridge. Gene's friends were interviewed afterwards, and they said something along these lines. You know, 15 years ago, he said, I intend to jump from the Golden Gate. And we were panicked, desperate, scared, didn't know what to do. But then that blew over, and then he said it again a few months later. Again, we were very concerned, very scared, worried, desperate. And that blew over. And then a year later, he said it again. And by this point, we're starting to say, that, that's just kind of how Gene is. That's what he does to blow off steam. Five years passed, he said it again. And by that point, we were like, yeah, right, that's kind of what he does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 10 years, said it again, 12 years. 15 years later, said it again. Friends had the reaction that by now they've been having for years, which is right, sure, Gene, that's just the way Gene blows off steam. And then he, did, and then he jumped to his death, just as he said he would. So those, those time frames can be long, and clinically, this is a vexing thing to deal with. It should be acknowledged. But the main truth should get through, which is that someone talks about their death about suicide, serious. So it's not just blowing off steam necessarily, and it's not just crying out for help necessarily. It's a potentially very, very dangerous health crisis that may end uh, in death. So that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, here's my email address if you want to follow up at all, and thank you for your attention. Clearly, I think there may be some arguments on this table or in the room about some of what is said today, and that's part of the conversation. Um, when researchers disagree, we as journalists need to understand what it is they disagree about. So, Chris Room. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Um, you know, this has been a really wonderful panel. I've learned a lot. Um, we're going to shift directions a little bit. Uh, I was asked to tell you about the effects of economic conditions on suicide, but also on health more generally. So my work here has looked at uh, health effects generally, of which suicide is one of them. So I'm going to try to give you the lay of the land. And you might think it's kind of obvious. Uh, so, so here's a cartoon. This came from the New Yorker in 1954. And I'm not sure if you can read the caption. It says, goodness, if a recession would be healthy, I'm for it. Well, we're going to see. Um, you might be surprised, although the effects for suicide you might, might be what you expect. But I want to give you a little bit of the lay of the land here. And if you've been following this literature in, say, the last 10 years, you know, you know what I'm going to tell you. If you haven't, if you've been going with what you think is true and what people thought was true up till say, 10 years ago, you're actually going to have some surprises, I think. So, so first, you know, this is kind of principles of economics here. You know, we know that bad economic times, economic contractions, 
uh, or recessions are bad for all sorts of reasons. Output falls, people are more likely to be unemployed, your housing, you know, the value of your house falls, and so forth. So there's lots of, of bad economic effects uh, of economic downturns. But in fact, we often think they're, they're broader effects. And so there might be effects on social factors like crime and marriage. I should add those effects, it turns out, are not as obvious as you might think, but I'm not gonna talk about them today. But then also there's this notion that, that we might expect to have a deterioration in both physical and mental health. And so that's what I'm gonna focus my remarks on. So what is the conventional wisdom here? I think the conventional wisdom is that uh, health is going to get worse when the economy gets worse. So when, when, we, when we have the, the Great Recession or even milder recessions, people get less healthy. And, and why might that be? Um, the first set of things that people mention are, are kind of psychological factors. So people are more stressed out. Maybe they respond to that stress through more risk-taking behavior. For example, uh, more alcohol and drug use. Now, we just heard that uh, alcohol and suicides aren't directly related, at least at the time, but, but presumably there's, there might be a, a more indirect relationship. People have poor mental health, they self-medicate with alcohol, that could at least be correlated with things like suicide. Um, but I want to point out there's also a set of economic factors that could pertain to health. So income falls, in many cases, income is protective of your health. We don't always understand all the reasons why, but certainly also in the United States, this is as opposed to many other countries, there could be a big effect on your health insurance coverage, and, and that obviously uh, could, could at least indirectly affect your health. So, so these are kind of, th this is sort of the standard story for why health might get worse when the economy tanks. Okay, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but these are the kinds of uh, equations that economists uh, like to write down. This is actually very simple. It might look complicated to some of you, but it's, it's really saying we got a left-hand side variable here, it's health. We've got a right-hand side variable we care about. In this case, it's the economy, and we look at how the two are related to each other after for controlling for a bunch of things, a, a bunch of X's. So these might be things like, uh, you know, age, sex, education, and so forth. Um, and the point here, most of the analyses up until the last 10 or 15 years looking at the relationship between economic conditions and health were simple time series analyses. And what I mean by that is we take data, say, from the United States or the United Kingdom over a long period of time, over a 40-year period, and look at how the, the outcome, so, so our health outcome and our, our, our measure of the economy go together. We're measuring a correlation. Um, I think this was described earlier as an ecological study. It's very hard to determine causation from this kind of a study because lots of things can change at the same time. Let me give you an example, um, and I'm going to mention some of the studies in a moment, but some of the early studies looked at data from the 1930s to the 1970s, looked at the relationship between economic conditions and health, and found that when the economy got worse, health got worse, or vice versa, when the economy got better, health got better. Well, it turned out the big action in there was at the end of the Great Depression, unemployment rates fell dramatically. But some other things happened too. For example, that was right the period when antibiotics were becoming much more available. So what is an, was it an effect of the economy or was it an effect of this new kind of medicine that was out there? Very hard to tell from these kind of studies. Well, what, what do we see when we look at them? It turns out, ironically, some early really good studies done during the 19... Uh, 20s, uh, it was 20s or 30s by Ogburn and Thomas and Iyer a little bit later, showed that uh, mortality increased when the economy got better. And they actually did pretty careful work on this. They, the data, the techniques weren't as good as what we have now, but they did careful work and they basically said, look, we've looked carefully, the, we think this result is right. Interestingly, about 10 years later, if you looked at their work, they were sort of ignoring their earlier work. I think it was just because they couldn't believe it, you know, at the end of the day. So the, the, the person whose name is probably, you've heard the most, M. Harvey Brenner, has done a whole series of studies arguing that there's 
uh, there's this relationship when the economy gets better, health gets better. And he looked at lots of measures of health, mental health, various measures of physical health, and so forth. Um, it, it turns out there's a number of potential problems with those studies, and they've been, they've been widely criticized. Um, there's, so when we look at more recent studies that have tried to deal with some of these things, the results are ambiguous, but mostly indicate a pro-cyclical variation in mortality. Pro-cyclical means when the economy gets better, mortality goes up. So good times are you're more likely to die. Now, th these studies have this fundamental problem that I mentioned. It's hard to measure causality well, and that's where we're going to go. But I want to point out, even these kind of studies, most of them show the counterintuitive, or at least maybe to many people, the counterintuitive result that deaths increase when the economy improves and fall when it decreases. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this very well. This is from a, a study I did, and, and this is basically looking at um, uh, kind of, it, it's kind of mimicking this time series analysis, although I'm going to show you what comes next later. But the point is, so we've got the mortality rate and the unemployment rate. Um, and I don't have pretty, you know, my graphics aren't as pretty as other people's. But if you look at this, it looks pretty much like a mirror image, right? So when the unemployment rate is going up, mortality is going down. Now I should tell you that uh, to get it to look like this, you have to do some data transformations. Things like put these on this, get rid of a time trend and, and put these so they have the same scale, so the same standard deviation. But this does not comport with your standard story that people get uh, uh, that, that, that they're more likely to die when times are bad. This is saying they're more likely to die when times are good because in good times, unemployment is low. Um, so that raises the question, why might we get the seemingly uh, counterintuitive result that health improves during downturns? And I'm, right now, I'm talking about physical health. I'm going to get to mental health and suicides before we're done, I promise you. Well, the first thing is, it turns out when times are good, we're, we're busily producing, we're, we're working harder, we're running our, our machines harder, and so, so, um, uh, uh, so when times are, sorry, I, I said it backwards. Here, here I'm saying when we have a downturn, so, so the reverse of what I just said. When there's a downturn, there's more slack in the economy. We're working fewer hours. We are producing less pollution. It turns out we drive less. All of these are risks to your health. Um, uh, and also, and I'm going to show you this, there's at least some evidence that we actually live healthier. And this is probably going to be counterintuitive, but we, we probably smoke and drink less. We exercise a little bit more. We're not going out to eat as much. And if you're like I am, when you go out to a restaurant, you don't eat your healthiest meals. So, so some of these things are, are, uh, are working at least potentially in the opposite direction. Now, I want to put in two important caveats here. First, this is not talking about the effects of an individual becoming unemployed. Those could have similar effects, but we're looking at the effect of the overall economy. Even in a really bad recession, most people who were working before are still working. There are some people, unfortunately, who are losing jobs, but most people do not. And so this is looking kind of at an average effect. And we're also not looking at an effect of a permanent change in economic conditions. We're saying what happens when the economy tanks, but then presumably is going to recover over time. Okay, I'm not even going to go into this, uh, except to say, if you look really carefully how this differs from the, the previous equations, you'll notice there's an extra J in there. A J in this case is a state or a country. It's, it's saying instead of looking at, uh, say, this aggregate time series, how, say, mortality changes with a change in unemployment, nationally, we're going to break it down more. We're going to look at a, a finer geographic unit, for example, a state. And we'll look at all 50 states. What is this bias? Uh, well, so this is giving you, oh my gosh, okay. So this is giving you an example of, and I'm going to go really quick here, of uh, California and Texas. And what I want you to notice, the first, uh, the top picture here is uh, deaths due to cardio coronary heart disease. Uh, sorry, the, the top picture is the unemployment rate, the bottom picture are deaths due to coronary heart disease, and you notice that California and Texas don't track exactly, and so we can use these variations, these uh, cross-state variations, to give us 
a, a better chance of teasing out causal effects. Okay, so now since I have five minutes, I'm going to show you. So when we use these kinds of methods, look at total mortality. Uh, there have been a whole set of studies now, and, and started with one that I did in 2000, showing a pro-cyclical variation in mortality, that, that deaths are more common in good times, not in bad times. Um, and so this shows you uh, from the 2000 study I mentioned. So all deaths, a one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate, increase, uh, 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 sorry, a one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate decreases deaths overall by about a half a percent, decreases most causes of death. Um, an exception is cancer. There's no effect here on cancer. But notice the other big exception here that I, you know, that I've highlighted, and I hope you can see that, suicides. Suicides go the opposite way of my measures of, of physical health. So when the unemployment rate goes up, suicides are predicted to increase, not to de decrease. So most kinds of deaths uh, fall when the economy tanks, but suicides increase. So, so coming back to the, the question at the beginning uh, today, yeah, the Great Recession, the, the collapse of uh, European economies, we would expect that to lead to an increase in suicides, even though most, most other measures of deaths are decreasing. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. And so this is showing you uh, the study I just mentioned and several other studies uh, using data from mostly from other countries and the predicted effect on suicides. And so you'll notice these effects are not uh, completely unambiguous, but most of them are positive. So that's saying when unemployment is going up, when the economy is weakening, suicides are increasing. So that, I'm guessing, is the what you would have thought would have been true coming in. It does appear to be true for suicides, whereas it's not true for many other measures of health. Um, this is showing you, it turns out it's really hard to measure um, uh, on these kind of big population studies, other measures of health. Deaths are easy to measure. They have their own issues. But there's a couple of studies that allow us to measure morbidity of various kinds, so, so health problems of various kinds. And again, you notice, this is from a study I did in 2003, you'll notice that most, um, most of the evidence is um, an increase in unemployment is associated with fewer medical problems for most types, again, that you're healthier. But again, look at the one I've highlighted, non-psychotic mental disorders, those are increasing. So again, this is suggesting that mental health is getting worse when times are bad, even though physical health is getting better. Okay, um, I mentioned this. I'm going to skip it. Let me let me say a few words about some of the potential mechanisms here. We don't fully understand these, uh, all of these, and some of them are, are ambiguous. But it appears that actually, when the economy gets worse, people drink less, not more. So so you might have thought people drink more in bad times. By most of the evidence, it's not completely universal, suggests so people drink less. You might ask, why might that be? Well, one reason is you don't have as much income, and it's, you know, so you may not, might not be able to afford it. Um, it's also at least possible that, that some of that's occurring because people aren't going out as much. So, you know, I, I can't afford, you know, I'm broke, I don't go to the bar, and so maybe I don't drink as much. Um, again, I want to stress that some of these lifestyle factors, the evidence is not as clear cut as for mortality. So I'm going to present, I'm presenting work that I've done. There is some other work that's a little more ambiguous. Uh, if we look at other things like uh, smoking, obesity, exercise, now the, the actually the, the measure here, this is the percent employed, not the percent unemployed. So, so the signs are reversed. Higher em, uh, employment which corresponds to lower unemployment, predicts more smoking, uh, more obesity, and uh, less exercise. So again, it, most of the evidence, not all, is suggestive that people live a little bit healthier when times are bad, not when they're good. Why might that be? Well, again, some of these things are costly. Many of these also take time, and, and in weak economies, you have more time available, so that could play a role. Um, I've also been told that one of the stories could be it, when times are bad, people try to control the things they can, you know, so your life feels a little more out of control. Maybe you try to respond by controlling some of the things you can. So I can't guarantee I'm going to have a job tomorrow, but I can go take a walk. I can make that decision. So that could be playing a role. I, I haven't looked at that uh, directly. 
Uh, let me just mention, mostly this does not seem to be a medical care story. It's not that people are healthier in bad times because they're going to the doctor more. For most kinds of medical care, when times are bad, people go to the doctor less, although there is some evidence for certain kinds of medical care that may not be true. Okay, I've got one minute, so let me just uh, mention some of the things we don't know. Um, and, and this is particularly relevant for things like mental health and suicides, the role of working conditions and job stress and, ge and stress more generally. Very hard to measure with these kinds of methods because we don't have very good uh, sort of population-wide measures uh, over a period of, of years that we can use. So that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm going to skip almost all of these. Uh, except, but I want to say a word about implications so you don't get the wrong impression. Nothing here in saying that the fact that people are physically healthier in bad times, that's not saying we want recessions. Uh, you know, the, I mean, clearly the costs are uh, overwhelmingly large. The message here is don't assume, you know, something just because you thought it was true, check the evidence. And also, obviously, the fact that physical and mental health may go in the opposite directions is relevant. Um, and then I also want to point out there's a lot of epidemiological research emphasizing the negative effects of unemployment, of becoming unemployed. And I want to stress this is not talking about the effect of you losing your job. The effect of an individual losing their job could be and almost certainly is bad in many and probably even most cases, even if it's not bad, even if a, a slack economy is not bad overall. And the effects on physical and mental health may differ, as I mentioned. Thank you. Now, um, what I want to do and I'm, I'm especially cognizant that Tom Joyner is going to have to leave us at about 12.15. I'm going to throw out one question to the panel and then have a conversation with all of you. And the question is simply this. From each of, we've gotten sort of four different disciplinary, interdisciplinary perspectives on the question of suicide here. From your perspective, if there was one intervention, one step, one change, most likely to lead to prevention, what would it be? And maybe, Tom, since you're going to have to leave, start with you. And well, um, maybe there's a few, but in the interest of time, maybe I'll just uh, focus on means restriction, mm -hmm. uh, restriction of access to lethal things. So um, guns. For, like guns, yeah. although that's fraught, of course, in our country. Um, but, but gun safety is not fraught. Anybody who's very pro-gun or very <laughs> anti-gun, pretty much everybody can agree, should be safe about guns, keep them locked, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, not everybody agrees on that, but I, you know, I live in the rural south, so um, I know this firsthand. But uh, it's still, it's dangerous and, and it's, a, it's a major thing. But keeping other lethal things you know, uh, away or, or difficult to access, that's, it's a major public health initiative that saves lives. So I think mm -hmm. I would choose that. Paul? Well, he, he chose a very good one. So I'll, ch I'll choose this, treating, recognizing and treating mental disorders. And not just treating them, but making sure they stay in treatment. Because the stories, I, I mean, I'm a psychiatrist, so I've seen hundreds of patients over the years. And it's hard to, in engage them, but once they're engaged, they really need to stay in treatment because our treatments are not that specific. It's, I always say it's tinkering. You've got to work with the patient, and I'm a, I'm a psychopharmacologist, so I use medication. And it, the first dr drug may not work, and so you've got to really have patience and stay with the treatment. And then when your illness recurs, if it does, you gotta go back into treatment. So we made a film about suicide, and it turns out that two of the ph physicians that we were, uh, we were interviewing their wives because they died by suicide, both of them had been in treatment before, but when they killed themselves, they were not in treatment. So you, not only do you have to get into treatment, but if it recurs, you have to go back to treatment. Ready? I would, I would add to that um, 
implementation of effective treatment. Uh, we did a study a few years back that was in JAMA showing that the rate of treatment of suicidal people has increased dramatically in the past 10 years, but the rate of suicide and suicide attempts stayed the same. And our guess is people are not getting into, they're getting into treatment, but there's a lot of bad treatment out there. And we have, and we've heard about effective treatments, uh, medications, behavioral therapies that, that work to decrease the risk of suicide attempts, suicide death. We've got examples of them in the literature. They're very rarely used in practice. Yeah. Chris? My, my point's actually related to that one. I, I think uh, we, we really need a, sy a systematic change in our system of medical care. It's extremely fragmented. And so for uh, issues, that, uh, health issues that lead to suicide, um, the, the care is very fragmented. It's often not effective and it's not often inconsistent. So I think we, we need to try to reorganize, reorganize our medical care system to really promote health, in this case, mental health, in a way that it doesn't currently. Okay. Questions from the floor. Lots to talk about here. Somebody? Anybody? Leap out of the box? Yeah, Tara. Kelly, could you bring Tara the microphone? Um, I'm curious if there in the trend patterns, if there's a big deviation across different cities, and if so, if that correlates to poverty within the city as opposed to a broad economic trend like a recession. Anyone? Uh, well, uh, you said in cities, I'm sorry, in, in certain areas. Um, across I, different cities. If there's a question. big disparity across different yeah. American cities, and if so, if there's a if that correlates to the um, to the level poverty. of poverty within that. City. I I haven't seen that. Certainly, the mm -hmm. highest rates are in the West, and I'm not sure the West has the highest poverty rates. And there is a, a study uh, by G Gibbons uh, that shows that suicide correlates with guns where guns are, the suicide rates are higher, but that's the only really specific one that I know of. Do you know about it? Is, is there anything, what about poverty generally? Is poverty a, in the list of risk factors? Does it show up on any of your work or are the particular stresses of poverty not associated with suicide particularly? We've seen some effects on on social disadvantage, we think about it, low income, low education, having not whopping effects, but some, some association with mm -hmm. suicidal behavior. And there's a really nice paper a couple years back on um, losing one's job, losing itself, so fall from high status being associated with suicide death. Fall, so, so loss of status right. may be more important than Where actual poverty itself. Right. Okay. And if I could ask one more question, I have the mic. Why is that not working? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, and that's a bit more straightforward on classification. You mentioned anorexia, and I'm curious. I, I know some people who died of anorexia, and they were classified as natural causes. Um, I'm curious if you, I mean, if, is it considered and classified suicide if you do starve yourself to death as opposed to having anorexia and then shooting yourself? So. Uh, no, I don't think it would be classified. If, if you die from starvation, it would be if you you know, jump off a bridge or do so, do something very serious that can easily be, be identified as suicide. Okay. And if I could follow up on a point that Dr. Clayton made in her remarks about this topic, that most of these deaths, deaths, premature deaths in anorexia nervosa, in the one study that I've done on the topic, it's nine out of 10 of these deaths are not due to self-starvation. People do die that way occasionally. It's usually from the cardiac consequences of self-starvation, but only one out of 10 of the deaths in our sample was like that. The other nine were what you might call conventional deaths by suicide that were unrelated to the self-starvation angle. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, Dr. Nook mentioned that um, you, you said a series of things. You said clinicians can predict no better than chance. Yes. Um, and then you made reference to a couple of other types of doctors, I think, that who may be predicted better. But could you just speak no. about that a little bit on more? On one about of my early slides, sure. On one of my early slides, um, it indicated that psychiatrists lose, 50% of psychiatrists lose a patient to suicide, 25% of psychologists do. So there's some differences in what percentage of different kinds of clinicians are losing patients. I wouldn't say that's because, and I've been accused of this at Grand Rounds presentations, saying that psychologists are better than psychiatrists at treating suicidal patients. They're seeing different numbers of patient, patients, different levels of clinical severity, 
but a good 25 to 50% of, cl of practicing clinicians on survey report losing a patient to suicide. Later, the prediction piece, uh, we ask clinicians, what's the likelihood that this person in front of you, this patient in the emergency department, is going to make a suicide attempt in the next six months? Their prediction is no better than a coin toss. We asked patients themselves, what's the likelihood you're gonna make a suicide attempt in the next six months? They were slightly better than chance. I see, and if I could just follow up that. Um, you talked about, I thought it was very interesting, the, talking about the test, the A IAT test. Is anybody else doing work in this area of trying to create better predictive testing? Absolutely, there's a lot of work being done around the country, around the world on using behavioral tests, neurocognitive tests, uh, genetic tests to try and improve our prediction of suicide attempts, of suicide deaths, all around the idea that uh, people don't always tell us. Sometimes they tell us, uh, and sometimes it's, they're telling us far out or far removed. Um, can we identify some objective marker? And, and Paul, okay. do you want to? I, I want to make a comment about that. There is a, uh, they did a study in uh, Stockholm, I think, and they have an inventory that has to do with uh, being violent, being even e experiencing violence as a child, and then being violent as an adult. And that test, your score on that test, they, they did it with suicide attempters who were in the hospital, and that test uh, on high violence predicted an outcome of suicide in years later. So that there are other psychological, there are some psychological tests out there too that may be encouraging. In, in the last conference we had here in Philadelphia, which was on youth violence, we heard a lot about uh, the CDC's Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey, general measure of life outcomes. Has that, we didn't talk about suicide there, but has that touched on suicide? Has that shown childhood adverse experiences leading to suicide later? So I know the data for suicide attempts, and yes, yeah. absolutely. Early childhood experiences increase the risk of suicide attempts, especially early in life. After age 22 or so, early mid-20s, the risk of attempt decreases if you haven't made an attempt previously. So it seems to be this window of um, elevated risk. You're at ele elevated risk later on, but yeah. really early on. Yeah. I think what research hasn't done a good job of, if I may, is combining these risk factors. So we know that there's a, there's a family history piece, there's a childhood piece, there's a later in life piece, there's aggression. There's, we haven't synthesized all this to say, this is how we can triangulate and predict time and place and person. Yeah, yeah and I, I would say that this, uh, this study is the only one I know of that links childhood abuse or aggression to an outcome of suicide later. So there aren't many out there. Okay. Yes. I, I, also, uh, I wanted to make one quick comment for, for journalists in general about thinking about predictors of risk. This is for suicide, but also for other things. You have to be very careful in reporting here. But let's say we discover some set of characteristics or some, uh, or some tests indicates you double the risk of an event. So you double the risk in this case of suicide. It still may be a very small risk and you want to be careful in your reporting, but also we want to be careful from a public policy standpoint. You know, it may be that the vast majority of people, even with a doubled risk, are not likely, are, are not going to, in, in this case, commit suicide or engage in crime or whatever. And so we want to be uh, very careful about drawing policy implications. I know, I know Matthew's very aware of that because he, he mentioned that in his presentation, but I think often the way things get reported in the media, that point gets lost. Okay, yes. So I'm fascinated, Dr. Clayton, that you could not find data on the relationship between PTS and suicide. And I'm wondering why is it a methodology issue, a diagnostic issue, and maybe Dr. Joyner has some insight into that as well from his military. Thank you for the question. Um, I, it, it partially is a methodology issue because many studies have not included PTSD. It really became a diagnosis in 1980, and so some of these studies uh, were back further uh, and they didn't consider it. Uh, but those that have, there's one from Sweden now that looked at people who were admitted to the hospital uh, after a suicide attempt and had psychiatric diagnoses. And they found no relationship in the follow-up between 
PTSD and suicide. They did find it with depression and bipolar illness and schizophrenia, but not um, PTSD. I think it's partially that, but I also think that the way to look at, another way to study su completed suicide is to identify 100 patients with PTSD and follow them for 10 years and see what the outcomes are. And I think we haven't had enough of those. We had a recent, this week, study from the vets who showed that vets with PTSD had higher death rates when they were followed up from many causes. They had more drinking and more drug abuse, and they died from, from accidents and other things. So they have higher death rates. And maybe when I read the details of that, I'll find suicides too. Uh, so that it, it just, it'll come. I, I would just say on this one also, since this is something we look at a lot at the DART Center, is that the study of the impact of PTSD across the lifespan is really very new. And there are some people doing that, but it's a pretty new field of study. There may be data out there, and over lunch I may see if I can even find any, but it's very, it, it's a new line of work. And I gather from people like Paula that, that PTSD and, and uh, depression are often comorbid as well, and so, That's a good so point. sorting it out may turn out to be a challenge. Uh, next question, yes. Hi, um, you were talking about uh, the correlation between the economy and the suicide rate, and I was wondering, regarding um, the protests that we've seen around the world and the Arab Spring, um, if you believe that there is a specific correlation between these kind of protests and um, suicide activism that relates to that, because those also relate to um, to the economy and um, the economic the economic status of different people. So most of the work I was presenting actually is um, for fairly highly developed countries, fairly industrialized countries, and there's actually a question about generalizability. There's some work for Mexico showing um, that these results hold for middle-income countries. Much less clear what's going on as you kind of go down kind of you know, to, to less developed countries. And then when we look at sort of some of the Arab nations, I think, you know, there the issues get really complicated. So we've got potential economic issues, but we also have, you know, a variety of other issues. Um, so I, I, I guess I don't know the answer there, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I would not infer from, from the data that I presented what that's going to imply for the Middle East. Are there, um, maybe any of you know, um, are there any databases or other places that journalists could go to look for data from regions like the Mideast or outside? Is, is there any place where global, uh, global data on suicide research is being collected? The World Health Organization website has data country, for countries that report it. Not every country reports it every year, but the World Health Organization maintains a, a running list of what suicide rates are by gender around the world. And for expert sources, WHO as well, or any other ideas? Expert sources for? For if people are doing, you know, reporting on, let's say, suicide in Egypt or something like that and want to find an expert source. I do. Beyond the scope of this essay. All right. <laughs> uh, International Association of Suicide Prevention. Maybe? Association of Suicide Prevention. Thanks, Mabby. IASP.org. IASP, yeah. yes. Excellent. Okay, one more. Yes. Um, I, have to, I have two questions. Well, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good reporter. You'll make two, one question into two. We know this, right? Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, this is actually, I guess, for, well, for Matthew Nock and Paula Clayton. Um, um, you mentioned that there are some bad treatments out there, and I'm wondering what kinds of treatments you feel are bad or not, not effective. Sure. Did anyone, everyone hear the question? What are, I'll say, ineffective treatments? You said bad treatments. Well, there's two pieces to this. There, there, there are bad treatments. There are treatments that make people worse. Uh, and there, there's a growing list of uh, treatments that harm. Uh, Scott Lilienfeld has a great paper on this in Psychological Science 2000-ish, uh, like 2008, I want to say. Uh, it's called Treatments That Harm, uh, Wilderness Training. 
critical incident stress debriefing, which yes. a lot of people are doing now in randomized clinical trials, it seems to be ineffective or harmful. People who get the treatment compared to the control condition are worse. So there are treatments that we're documenting are bad for you. Uh, rebirthing can kill people, you know, case, case, case people dying from it, unfortunately. Uh, and there are treatments that we just don't have documentation on whether they're effective or not. And if you go to a practicing clinician, I'll speak for psychologists, because I don't want to bash psychologists, psychiatrists or social workers. If you go to a psychologist, who knows what you're going to get? You might get effective treatment. You might get ineffective treatment. You're more likely to get it. treatment of unknown efficacy because it's not well regulated and we don't know what a lot of people are actually doing in their practice. What we're talking about here are, are randomized clinical trials where if you do this carefully manualized treatments, you'll have a lower risk of, of attempting suicide. Most people aren't trained in these interventions and don't, many people don't even know about them, unfortunately. There are a list of evidence-based treatments. Uh, so treatments that have been shown in randomized clinical trials across multiple groups have positive effects. And, and the same is true for uh, psychiatrists and use, who use either psychotherapy or antidepressants or a combination. Uh, and th there are many people who don't use them well. I mean, so I, there's no specific ineffective treatment uh, for, the, for depression. There are probably 25 antidepressants on the market, and they all have to be approved by the FDA for, to, to treat efficaciously depression. But how they're applied uh, is left to the clinician, so it's... It's, and, and, but I must say that there are very conscientious psychiatrists who uh, are treating depressed patients very well, and they still have suicides. If I would go to a meeting of psychiatrists and start by saying, how many of you have had a suicide in your practice, I would say it's not 50%, but I'd say 90% of the audience raises their hand, because we treat those people who are potentially suicidal. That's the group we get these much more severe patients. All right, um, we're gonna break there. I wanna thank all of you for an enlightening and inspiring and, and mind-altering panel. <laughs>